G'day, Adam, VK4GHZ, and with me is Doug, VK4OE. G'day, Doug. G'day, Adam. And uh, what are we doing today? Well, what are we doing here? It's um, that, uh, Brisbane VHF Group's uh, microwave tune-up and test day, and, and we've got some, a whole lot of test equipment set up that can test for many microwave bands, and uh, people are going to be bringing along uh, gear that they've made or got from all sorts of places, and be testing and trying it and see how best we can make it all work. There seems to be a growing uh, amount of uh, enthusiasm and activity in microwaves at the moment. Yeah, it's picking up quite well and uh, uh, it's a great, been a great buzz. Yeah, it's great to see. Alright, well, let's go inside and see what they're up to. Okay, let's go. G'day, I'm, I'm Kevin, VK4UH. Um, had a long-term interest in doing some microwave work and I've uh, assembled a series of transverters uh, for various microwave bands extending from uh, uh, from 2.4 gigs, uh, 5.7 and, and 10 gigs, all in uh, next uh, medical cabinets. All the transverters I've built are uh, based around the DB6NT uh, transverter modules from Germany and I've assembled them into cases with all the necessary um, power supply for driving relays and sequences uh, and um, and preamps and uh, PAs and all, the intention is that they all go out on block they all work on 12 volts they're all lockable with the same um, 10 meg GPS they all work with an FT817 they all go on the same stand and interface up with the same dish so I basically just take them out in a pack and swap one module for the another as we go from one band to the other uh, the 10 gig unit that uh, that I uh, have set up for you to see out on the trolley has a 2 watt output capability. The 5.7 gig unit has a, an X commercial PA which we've modified and that makes about 12 watts on, uh, on 5.7 gigs. And currently the 2.4 gig system is just running 2.5 watts with a possibility of building um, uh, a bigger PA into the same case. The beauty of having a big box is that you can put bits and pieces in, modify things easily if, if you uh, am it into a box that's too small and you want to change something, it's very difficult. So, although they are a little bit cumbersome, they, they're quite useful and uh, all comes together. So, here's the 10 gig uh, transverter set up on, um, on what's basically an X Theod like tri uh, tripod. It's a 600 mil dish. Um, I've got a various number of antennas which I can slot. They're all interchangeable, just interference fit into the, uh, into the dish so that I can change over. This particular one is, uh, comes out on waveguide, so I've got uh, waveguide clamps with the old-fashioned quick-fit slip rings to, uh, to transfer across. Um, this is a GPS module, came from England, it's commercially available, made by a ham over there, just gives you a nice stable 10 meg reference and the, the DB6NT modules have that facility. They have their own oscillators in them and if you just run them up they work pretty well but if you want to, uh, to have any more stability you just plug them in and as soon as it sees an external 10 meg signal they switch over and use that and it takes out you know, the one big variable of not knowing whether you're on the right frequency or not to the, to the guys you're trying to talk to and, and makes it possible to consider things like digital, digital operating and the various modes of the work are well, well below the, the noise floor and aircraft scatter and all these other things where there's, uh, there's good potential for getting some range. They're all designed to run around an 817. Beautiful little transceiver that, uh, you know, it's handbag portable. Some of the uh, transverters have 432 meg IFs, some of them have 434 meg IFs, some of them have 2 meter IFs, doesn't matter, the, uh, the 817 will cope with all those. Uh, and I've built into this some power outlets so that you're not fumbling with leads, everything just plugs into the front panel and it's uh, very easy to use and set up for quick, quick setup for when you go out portable. What we're doing here is a return loss a measurement and adjustment looking into the, uh, the the 10 gigahertz input port of a dual band feed horn that Doug has made and what we have is uh, directional couplers, microwave directional couplers which have been set up for a leveled input this directional coupler is producing a leveled input from the signal from the sweeper and this uh, directional coupler here is was set up for um, a leveled forward reading that gave a reference level on the power meter and then the uh, it was turned around and it's now giving the return 
loss as seen by reflected power coming back into the meter. And if we're able to look at the little needle on here, uh, if it was right up at the end here, it would be complete reflected power. And what is happening is that this is only showing five decibels of, um, of return loss at the moment, which is not very satisfactory. We've had adjustments with, for instance, this 10 gigahertz horn, and we're able to achieve more than 20 dB return loss by adjusting that little adjustment screw, um, which was found experimentally to be the right place for it. Um, using a, uh, a ball bearing and a magnet by moving the ball bearing around on the inside and, and the magnet on the outside there. So that's quite uh, a lot of fun when you, when you get, get into microwaves. As I mentioned earlier on my 10 gig system I've arranged to come out in waveguide. Here's actually a transition inside the case. Uh, and these from just various bits and pieces. This is a, a penny feed that I assembled myself in the in the kitchen basically didn't require any special tooling and I've got a, a number of different feeds which are just an interference fit through the uh, the middle of a commercial dish of, a, of some nondescript origin so here's another one and they can just be into interchanged and uh, they just slot in it takes five seconds to change one feed for another and I have another another feed that I've made up for 5.7 gigs which just fits into the same um, the same um, interference hole in the middle of the dish so again it's very easy uh, it's all mounted on just a piece of alloy plate there's a, a, a hole that we milled inside which matches the thread on a theodolite tripod so it just all goes together with a thumb nut underneath and I used a pair of CDs as bearings underneath just to uh, to allow the dish to uh, to spin freely uh, for when you want to um, to alter your heading and, and to get it level use a little tiny spirit level and um, just alter the, the length of one of the legs to get roughly horizontal and pointing the direction you want so all very easy and quick assembled with little more than hand tools and a blow lamp so you should be able to wind the wiper down to ground one way and match the other if you just want that's to meter right, it. So I want it yeah, well, yeah. Okay, so that's what we need to find out on the, on there, one's transmit, one's receive. So yeah, find that's out TX, this one. is the TX one. Which one? This one here that says TX okay. gain. Now we've got to find out, we're going to turn that right down so that there's no power out from there. Oh, g'day, I'm Peter, BK4EA. I'm just uh, show you some of my test gear I brought down for the test and tune up day. So here we've got a Snoop oscillator. It's an old HP device, but um, very stable. Got plug-ins uh, from 1.8 to 18 gigs. I use that for measuring return loss on antennas, feed horns, and that sort of thing. Uh, pretty useful for that. An old spectrum analyzer I picked up uh, quite cheap in the surplus market. Uh, the signal generator, which I use with the cone generator, which produces um, uh, harmonics right up the spectrum, so it's very useful as a signal source. Um, my frequency counter, which is good for 26 gigs. Um, again, not very expensive, got that in the surplus market. Very useful device. And my portable uh, signal generator, which is not finished yet. Um, I just ordered uh, Adam vk 4 gh heads designed for that. It's based on the Graham Burns XTK design. And at the moment it's putting out a harmonic on 5.7 um, gigs. So you can see it's a, a relatively clean signal, not bad for a harmonic. And uh, this instrument is, is pretty old but, and uh, I've been trying to baby it so I can keep some years into it because it's uh, pretty expensive to replace. So starting, starting from the left, um, just a bit of Spectrum Analyzer 101. This is a frequency device, so we're sweeping the frequency from left to right rather than a probe sweeping in time from left to right. So this is showing a harmonic or a signal, if you like, on around about 5.76 gigahertz. So that's uh, coming out of the signal generator. And it's relatively clean, so you can see there's not too much stuff here inside. I can blow it up a bit, so you can see you get that away. So what I'm doing is I'm widening the bandwidth. So you can see, oops, you can see just how clean the signal is. And these little bits of fur around here are known. If you get that too wide, that's known as phase noise. 
Um, so you can see that's relatively clean. I'm pretty happy with that. As a portable field source, it's ideal. It's perfect. So starting from the left, the controls are the tuning control that moves um, the display left and right, much like the um, time ace on a, on a probe. This is the bandwidth control, so I can go in and have a look at all the spectrum. So that's I mean that's 50 megahertz from here to here, and obviously that's quite a small slice. And this is the attenuator. So you have to be careful not to put too much signal in these things, otherwise you will uh, blow them up. And uh, that allows me to change the height. So that as a way more attenuation in. So you can see the signal increase. Oh, that's the reference. So that's uh, the attenuator. Other than that, it's a very, very basic device. There's nothing too complicated about it. It's 1980s vintage, so um, they're very easy to drive for, uh, for home use. Just discovered is that by moving away from 10.3 gigs where he wants it to tune by going down to 9.8, was it? 9.8. Um, that it goes down that's to 16 where the dB. Feed works best. 16 dB at 9.8 gigs. It's exciting when you find this because then you know that you've got some adjustments to do. Well, it, it means that the the feed inside the end of the the uh, dual band feed is actually too long, so it's actually going to be shortened it by 500 megs to uh, to that's shift it up, lot. and that's a lot. Yeah. Well, the uh, the length of the feed in there is only seven mil long, so 500 megs, you know, that represents quite a percentage of change. I'll be half a mil, I would say. Yeah. Uh, the hard part is the fact that it's right down inside and it's soldered on trying to get in there to actually do any adjustment got some work to do on that one doug yeah well the problem is it's right down inside the tube well you just have to get in there hmm. Start again. Easy, easier said than done e but it's the actually, old story. actually yep. you know something uh, by the way I did that, I, if I've got a good run in there with the soldering on, I can probably move that pin enough to actually adjust it by the, uh, the, you know, uh, the at length least of, a fraction of a mil. The length of the pin is probably the less critical adjustment compared to the position of it in relation to the yep. back shore. Another little uh, trick I stole from somebody else is uh, a quick little ident system using the 817. Using the, it, it has an internal CW key here. I just brought this out to a switch on the front panel. And while we're around this side of the dish, when you flick the switch up in CW mode, it just sends out a series of peeps or uh, another ident signal. Very handy for, uh, for peaking the dishes on receive and transmit. Well, that concludes part one of Brisbane VHF Group's microwave tune-up day. Hope you've enjoyed the video so far and we'll see you in part two.